How I came up with that story, I don't know. I know that I came up with the cicada as a visual metaphor, and of course they couldn't do it then, you know, and I didn't know they couldn't do it because, you know, I was a writer, <laughs> not somebody who was, you know, had to worry about the technical difficulties. What's that? But to me, it was a, a wonderful challenge, not only great fun, but a great challenge because I was able to play both good and evil, uh, a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing, which is uh, enjoyable for any actor. And uh, plus, I uh, really admired uh, Philippe Mora. I had seen uh, um, Mad Dog Morgan, which I thought was fantastic, and uh, Brother Can You Spare a Dime, and you know, uh, he was no slouch, so you know, I, uh, and it produced by the same producer of the Omen series, and you know, not too shabby. I'd done uh, King Kong, Logan's Run, so we'd done some, some creature films, and we'd already done The Deer Hunter, so um, blood and all of that was pretty easy. What was my character in The Beast with him? Now, I, when when F Philippe called, it, I don't think it had been thrust, flushed out really well, but I think he was uh, um, sort of interested in his daughter. He was probably as interested in his daughter, Kitty, as he was his wife. What you doing here, girl? We have just taking us a little walk, Pop. It's a cool movie. It's a cool movie, and we were cutting edge of what special effects were doing at that time. How did I get involved with The Beast Within? Harvey Bernhardt had liked some spec script I'd written, and he asked me in, and he had bought this book proposal. The book was not written, and it was he bought it because of the title, The Beast Within, because he specifically wanted to do a physical transformation of a man into a monster. So I was signed to write The Beast Within off the title, and the only given was there had to be a, a, a transformation. So the, what I had used was the cicada or the katydids, which, which, which come out, which are reborn every 13 and 17 years, depending on the, on the, the, the type of, of cicada, and they shuck their exoskeleton and step forward into the world as these rather pretty winged insect creatures, they mate, and then they die, which I thought was a great metaphor for, uh, for, uh, for, what, for what Michael was going through. It's all Freudian, it's all sec you know, you know, psychosexual. It, it, it echoes the desperation to, 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 to continue on down through the generations, the, the the conflict that Michael feels because he falls in love with the man, the Platt, and yet, you know, this, this lovely, lovely teenage girl his age, and yet he knows this, this monster inside is going to kill, kill her because she's a Kerwin, because the, the, the beast wants revenge on the, on, the, on the family. I mean, look, look at what you have in it. You have cannibalism. Yeah. Billy Connors, he, he is starved to death. One of the Kerwins kept him prisoner and starved him. And then when he, when he was dying of starvation, killed his wife and threw her, the woman that, that Billy Connors loved, who was chained in the, in the cellar, he throws the dead bo body down. So he, he, he's forced to eat the, 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 the flesh of his beloved woman I'm, I'm, and then feeds him for 17 years on, 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 on corpses robbed from the... I mean, it is horrible. So yes, it's, it's, it's full of all of these gothic, you know, you know, moments and themes. And, and yet, finally, it, the beast within is about young love. You feel for Michael, the boy who's, who's, who's falling in love, and of course, every time he gets, he gets close to her and he gets excited by Amanda, you know, you know which is to say every time, you know, as he, you know, he starts to harden, the, the beast inside of him 
emerges more and more. And he, he, so he's, his lust is commensurate with the desire to kill her and eat her. I mean, I mean, I mean it's madness. I, I don't know how I ever got away with it. Whoever killed the others is going to come for you, Amanda. I was then and still am uh, a fan of horror films. So getting the role in The Beast Within was uh, kind of a dream come true for me, really, uh, in that, um, you know, I also got to play the monster. In fact, (laughs) part of my insistence up front was that I could actually be in the final costume because I knew they probably got a stuntman for some of that. But I said, I really want to be able to do that, to be able to say I did actually play the the final creature as well. I said, all right. (laughs) Um, I didn't really know what I was letting myself in for by saying yes to that, but it was, uh, it was an adventure. There's the director and there's the cast and there's the crew and it's kind of like different communities within a community and the actors are responsible to the director. Uh, many directors are like cattle herders. They just say do it and don't ask why. and. There's not really much of a connection there. Philippe made it over that boundary. He was one of us. He was the leader of the Lost Boys, and we were the Lost Boys. And uh, we trusted him. I trust him. Philippe is a fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants kind of guy. He, He will always take on a challenge. He's fast, he's creative, he's brave. Um, and his point of view is extraterrestrial, I think. I, uh, he just comes at things oddly. And his background as a documentary filmmaker, I think, adds a, an interesting perspective to the stories that he tells because it is, everything has kind of a, I think, a documentary kind of storytelling to it, the way it unfolds. And there aren't many people that maintain a style like that, but he's been true to that that style and true to that that freedom. Um, let's let's just roll and see what happens. Now I think this was 1980. And there, there was no such thing yet as effects as we understand them now. And there was certainly no CGI. There, was, there, was no, there were no computers. And the, the state of the art w- w- was very, very primitive. They had pneumatics, which is to say air bladders, but that was about all. And as I remember, Tom Berman wasn't even an effects man. He was a makeup man, leading edge in terms of of making people up, but not in terms of, 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 of doing transitions on screen. The state of the art at the time was, uh, was Joe Dante's The Howling, and I don't think American Werewolf in London was out yet. So they had to invent it to do it for the first time. And this, this in no way is a, is a, is a, is a put down on Tom Berman because he took the technology, the pneumatic technology, a step further. But it, the technology was not at the point where it could do what I wrote. The, the, the emergence of, of the beast from within Michael's body wasn't really technically doable then. The, the leading edge of, of the technology that Tom Berman was using was makeup, which is what he did, and, he, and air bladders. The puppetry, the stuff that they did, that Berman and those guys did, the, 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 the mask designs, the, the, the blood, were really intricate and really, really detailed. And, and yet, it didn't take a huge amount of time. You know, it, it, it seemed like, I'd, I've been on other science fiction thing. I did a, a TV series where I played a, a dog, that, a, a man that was regressing into a Rottweiler for some reason I don't know what that was all about but it it it, those, it took forever to do that and Berman and those guys were just 
so fast, so on top of it. Love Tom. He's he's uh, marvelously talented and, and as nice a guy as he is talented. And uh, he and his crew were just uh, you know fabulous to work with. Um, I at one time in, in in my life when I was a kid, actually earlier before I became an actor, I had wanted to become a makeup artist. So I was totally down with that. And uh, I didn't mind the hours and hours in the makeup chair because I was fascinated by the process and, and enjoyed working with them on this. And, uh, and they were very collaborative. The uh, interesting thing is that after um, I did that film, in, in, oh, I don't know, several years later, I wound up working with Tom uh, doing makeup effects, uh, makeup special effects for uh, the film One Dark Night. Uh, Meg Tilly's uh, first film, as I recall, <laughs> where she's menaced by uh, various corpses that come to life through telekinesis. And I actually sculpted a couple of those corpses. This woman holding prayer beads and a Bible that comes drifting down in a white dress. Uh, she was one of mine. And a, a, there was a little a child corpse that I worked on as well. Um, so, you know, that uh, that was, you know, cool to be able also to work with, with uh, Tom professionally. <laughs> Mechanical effects supports almost everybody on a film, uh, one way or another. Any anything that's uh, too scary, too heavy, too dirty ends up being our job. So, uh, Tom was a, uh, you know, I, I hadn't worked with him before, but I I did know his work, and I'd worked with a lot of makeup artists, and uh, uh, he was an interesting guy. He might do the small stuff, and then uh, we we'd supply everything else. <laughs> Working with uh, Tom and his crew, the, the uh, transformation scene, that took days to shoot, about three days it took to shoot that, uh, you know, the final transformation. That was an involved process because they had to uh, take a mold of my entire body from head to toe and then separate ones for the hands and feet and face and oh my god. Uh, so, you know, that was an experience. And then um, uh, working with all the stages of the transformation. The only thing I wasn't too thrilled about, and it was a kind of stopgap thing because I think certain um, pieces hadn't arrived yet. You know, you, that's the problem when you're on location and some, you know, out of the way a place, a package may not arrive or whatever, and you have to shoot that night. And they had to improvise uh, some plumpers for me. Later, I wore these marvelous fake gums that were made to fit over my own gums. My teeth were my own, and they would discolor them. But the gums, all swollen and puffy, were uh, artificial gums. And, uh, and they changed the shape of my mouth, which you can see in the film as I begin to transform. But the first night we needed to do that effect, those things hadn't arrived, so they had to make do with foam rubber pieces which were cut and stuffed in there. Unfortunately, what no one had realized was that this chemical was going to leak out from the foam. And I got these like terrible like canker sores on the you know grooves of uh, the upper and lower parts of my mouth down in there, you know, where it's sort of sensitive. It's like, ah, <laughs> uh, fortunately we'd gotten the scenes at that point, but it, uh, and thank God I didn't have to do more of those plumper scenes the next day or two. So they were able to heal and it was no problem, but that was sort of an unexpected uh, thing there. It was done in you know stages, and there was about six stages to it, and each stage would require another you know four or five hours of makeup. And at one point, I looked like William Hurt in Altered States. <laughs> that was that was an experience with all the bladders. And fascinatingly, at one point there was a mistake. Something actually went too far, and it's when my back opens up. And the thing was carried so far that, that the, the bladders became exposed, the air bladders. And one was like reddish and one was a kind of a greenish yellow. But being covered with methyl cell and all the goo, it looked fabulous. They looked like organs, weird organs. being you know, So they kept it in. It's technically a mistake, but it looks great. I remember the head starting to swell up and do its thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, There were bladders inside. We provided air. Uh, some logistic support. Whether Philippe went too far or not with, uh, with the uh, bladder effects is a matter of debate. The only time I guess he could be said to have done that possibly is with what uh, we began to call the, or what we later called the medicine ball head, a sort of weird Charlie Brown looking. <laughs> but I'll tell you why I actually really like that is because earlier in the film, there's this marvelous foreshadowing of that with R.G. Armstrong, who I love, you know, playing my doctor in the film, where he squeezes this little toy 
which we called an obi, I remember, and he'd squeeze this and the head goes just like what happens to me. So it, it, it's so exactly prefigured and foreshadowed earlier in the film that when you see that, it's kind of a full circle kind of cumulative thing. I, I find it cool. I mean, yes, it's outrageous, but you know, come on, you know, this is not uh, Dostoevsky we're doing here. Philippe has a glint in his eye that the minute he walks in a room, you know, this is not going to be any ordinary day. He uh, was driven, focused. He'd get in there and you'd see, he's like, okay, and here you go. I want you to do this and I want you to do that. I was putty in his hands. I'd do anything for him. He was great. It was a very uh, dramatic, emotional scene. Um, there's a fine line uh, when you're portraying a character uh, that you have to, to a certain extent, experience what that character experiences. Uh, one of the job, the difference between a, an actor and a crazy person is that an actor has a definite as to what is about them and what is about the character. Sometimes you hear stories about method actors where that line gets a little too fuzzy and, and that's how you get hurt. There was a body double. Um, maybe I shouldn't admit that. But yeah, there were certain things that I was not able to do that uh, she was able to do far better. We were out in a um, pretty low-lying flat all of that part of Mississippi is kind of cold and damp, and, and uh, they had a berm and the whole rape scene, uh, the car part of it, her running through, and then uh, um, they were out in this area that you we had picked out, and uh, I remember the it's the first time we saw the saw the uh, character as a as a monster. There was a, a guy from the, I think he was from the wardrobe department, named John Lemons. Great big guy, huge. And I don't know how he did it, but he had an electric blanket out in the middle of a swamp. Must have been the longest extension cord ever. But when I would come off this, I was cold, and he'd just wrap me up. I'll never forget that, that he just, I was taken care of. She got pretty hypothermic, I think, and uh, turned kind of blue. And when we were finally done, and we were there several hours, um, helped carry her out of the place. And then uh, what was really funny is everybody had had enough that had taken off. Of course, all the principals jump in, in the car, and they're gone. And suddenly we're there with the car. And no way to, there was no way to get the, uh, the picture car, the hero car, back to town. So they asked us to take it. So we took it back to town. It was a death trap and fog and driving through that part. It was, it was a horror show on its own. It was admittedly one of the strangest scenes I've ever been asked to do. Uh, here I am having to tear the clothing off this girl. It was supposed to be um, uh, my girlfriend in the film, uh, Kitty Ruth Moffat. In fact, it was not. It was a body double. It was freezing. I felt so bad for this poor girl out in the woods at, at night. And it was so cold that when I tore her pre-torn clothing off with my beast claws, uh, steam actually rose from her skin. It was, it was literally that cold. And, uh, um, and I have to simulate this rape inside of this costume, which is restrictive in terms of what I could see and what I could hear. So admittedly, I, you know, I, I, I could hear Philippe kind of, you know, I could hear him, but not as clearly as I would prefer. This thing wasn't made for easy hearing or easy sight. So I'm kind of feeling my way and seeing as best I can what I'm doing. And, you know, Philippe is sort of giving me little encouragements, uh, uh, how to move. And I remember him saying, uh, uh, can you come to some sort of climax? And I, I think at one point he probably grabbed me, and so he pressed me and moved me a certain way. It, it was, uh, you know, I mean, here I am in here, and it's, you know, it was sort of uh, difficult, you know, and uh, constrictive, and I did my best under the circumstances. It, it, it was, you know, strange to begin with. He was less than um, aggressive about it, and uh, and the girl was, uh, she was. Yeah, young, 20-ish, whatever, and it was very cold. 
and as it went on, he wasn't as enthusiastic as Philippe wanted. So, so I remember uh, him pressing a little throttle with his foot, <laughs> a little more uh, activity. I don't, I'm not sure what he, the exact words he used, but it was pretty funny. Try, everybody's trying not to giggle. She's still alive. Let's get her to the hospital. One of the things I liked about shooting on location in general is that it's really easy to climb into character, to let your whole reality become what that is. And uh, where we were, we were in this uh, little town outside of Jackson, and uh, there's a lot of camaraderie amongst the crew and the cast. And we had a lot of fun. I think we were filming six days a week, long days. Uh, it's always long days, but long days, climbing in and out of swamps. Um, it was an adventure. It was a real adventure. What's that? Down there. Oh, that's Black Pine Bog. Nobody ever goes there, though. I got stung on my eyelid, and my eye got huge. We're out in the middle of a swamp. Who knows what I was stung by? <laughs> <laughs> and we had all these close-ups to do, and here I am, and I looked like the monster. I'm supposed to be the pretty one, but I look like the monster. And yeah, those makeup people got in there, and you see a lot of my profile in one point of the movie. And there was one, they gave me an antihistamine that knocked me out cold. So those scenes where you see me sleeping, I really was. It stuck me in bed and filmed around me, set me on my side so you didn't see that half of my face had this huge uh, bug bite. Uh, that closed my eye shot. I'm not a big fan of the South, and that m Mississippi was one of the reasons why. Um, although it is beautiful, it, it's it's just the the South. It's it's a it's a strange place, and um, the, uh, I remember it being pretty cold at, at night. And I do remember w one sideline story. Meshach Taylor and I wanted to go have a have a drink and it was a dry county we had to go to county line so the only place that, that we knew of was this country western bar and Meshach's going I'm not going to a country western bar I'm not going to no, it's going to be alright it's going to be alright we walk in and it was like the worst movie ever because it just got quiet and all the heads turned to look at Meshach we did not belong there it was it was pretty frightening and, and he was scared and I was scared and and uh, to get back at me, I think, he asked me if we went down to Jackson State, I think, um, to talk to a, a, a class. And he asked if I wanted to go get some ribs. So we went into his neighborhood. And of course, I was the only white person there. And, and uh, people were looking at me like they looked at him. And I go, oh, thanks, Mish. I needed that lesson. <laughs> We were uh, in, in the Mississippi State Lunatic Asylum. Now that's a correctional facility and they had an extremely high security place right there with gun emplacements and electrified fences. But the part we were filming that, sec that section for um, were the older buildings where they actually had done electroshock therapy and that was some of the, we didn't have to do a set basically walk in, put a gurney up, and, and that was it. Uh, we also went to a closed hospital that was closed due to staff. So it wasn't safe for the public, but you could bring a movie company in, of course. <laughs> Just what happens to us a lot. And uh, that was difficult. I don't think anybody wanted to be there for that. Oh boy, that was an experience and a half. Um, Especially, especially the uh, institution where we shot the uh, transformation scenes, the hospital sequences in the later part of the movie. That was shot in the Whitfield State Institution. And um, it, first of all, it looked beautiful. It was, it was like a, um, it looked almost like UCLA. It looked like a huge university campus. You'd have no clue that you were on the grounds of some large, you know, multi-building, you know, uh, uh, institution for, for, uh, um, mentally ill people, but um, it was a, it was very creepy 
because of the um, disused state of parts of the building. There was a basement there that was beyond belief. I went down there and found myself in this labyrinthine collection of rooms that were covered with like greenish incrustations. It looked like the whole thing had been underwater for, for, for years uh, with like barnacles on the walls. Um, uh, it had uh, equipment for like hydrotherapy. I mean, you know, we're talking turn of the century, turn of the previous century kind of stuff. Marble tables with leather straps and these frightening looking uh, uh, accoutrements sticking out of the walls, weird implements and metal things, it, it, you know torture porn kind of uh, territory, you know, scary. Um, um, and when we were shooting there, um, a couple times patients would come in in the midst of things we were doing. At one point I was uh, playing a game of catch with uh, one of the other actors using, um, I think it was Don Gordon's severed head from the film and we were like tossing this back and forth like a basketball and then we turn and look and we see this patient standing in the doorway kind of <laughs> staring at us and, oh, <laughs> probably set his therapy back a, a bit. Um, and then uh, uh, same thing with doing the transformation scene. Here I am hooked up to all these air bladders and I'm convulsing and spewing out methyl cellulose, which they've injected into my mouth and you know, going through all of this stuff. And again, we'd turn and there would be you know a couple patients staring and God knows what they were thinking of us. And the, um, the head of the institution, the, he, was, he was quite a character who told us some rather memorable stories about them having, as I recall, a, a cannibal ward. And uh, yeah, like Silence of the Lambs time, very, very memorably strange. Um, there was also another hospital where we shot earlier uh, in the film. That one was haunted, apparently. Um, and, you know, you just can't uh, beat that genuine small town atmosphere. Um, now, even though we were based in Jackson, and that's where some of interior, the interior scenes were shot, uh, there was a converted gymnasium turned into a sound stage where we shot a number of sets, the cellar being one of those sets, and so forth. Um, most of the exteriors there were shot in this little town called Raymond, Raymond, Mississippi. And that was just this authentically, you know, isolated, Lovecraftian kind of town and uh, the atmosphere was amazing. The people were great, you know, really, really hospitable and, and friendly. Um, and so, you know, I felt comfortable in that sense, you know, but uh, it sure had uh, a memorably odd atmosphere in which to film, which, which helped the movie tremendously. I've been very fortunate in my career and I've, I've received many compliments, but the compliment that meant the most to me that I remembered all these years was when we were shooting uh, the, a series of scenes that we were out in the swamp and it was cold. It was February. So we're out there and oh, it was freezing. And I'm in a little cotton dress and it's so cold. And so there was this little gas station that consisted of a cash register and maybe one pump and a, you know, you could buy tobacco or something. That was, that was it. And there were it was very late at night, and I was very, very cold, and the honey wagons are a mile and a half away. And so these two old guys that sat at the gas station would play cards opened it up and allowed me to come in. And I was very grateful to get in where it was warm, and I, I sat with them, and at one point I, they were, you know, we were just chatting. Well, the accent that I used in this movie was one that I worked very hard on, and I worked with a number of vocal coaches here in Hollywood to learn how to speak like that. And one of these old guys, he just reached over and in a grandfatherly way patted me on the knee and he said, we're real proud of you, local girl like you in a big Hollywood movie. And I just said, why, well, thank you. Thank you. There's got to be something you can do. A month ago, he was a healthy, perfectly all right, happy kid. Ronnie Cox is, he was just lovely to work with. I was basically an amateur at the time, and so he uh, was very nurturing and very kind and uh, kind of helped me find my way a little bit. Uh, a fun guy. He was this obsessive runner, and uh, you know, every morning, and you know how early you have to get up uh, when you're you know, filming, 
and he'd be up a couple hours earlier than we were out running and he would run his number of miles or whatever very disciplined uh, very disciplined runner of course marvelous actor I'd loved him since Deliverance and a lot of other things and you know it was uh, you know really good working with him a good talented musician he uh, did a couple songs one of which you can still hear in the movie a thing called Old Devil Whiskey and he did another song called The Beast Within which didn't actually wind up in the movie I did get to to spend uh, a, a couple of evenings with him, listening to him tell stories. And he's such a great rock on tour storyteller. And B.B. Besh, we became friends and um, got together a number of times, uh, quite apart from the film, and would have lunch together and so on. And um, it, it uh, was so sad to me when, uh, when she passed away. Uh, she died of uh, cancer, and you know that was a shock. She was so young. And, uh, you know, had a thriving career. She had just done, you know, a little while before that, uh, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and, you know, so forth. And um, just a wonderful lady, terrific actress, and, you know, I miss her. Bibi Besh, um, rest her soul, was another magic person. And I, I really had, a, had an affection for Bibi. Casting has to work in two ways. It has to work in that you have people that are appropriate to play those characters and to tell the story in the best possible way. But you also have to get people that are going to work together because you become kind of comrades in arms in creating this story. And uh, Bibi and Ronnie and me and Paul, and we just got along like a house on fire. You're beautiful. (laughs) Don't you know that? Kitty Ruth Moffat was wonderful to work with. Uh, sweet, smart, you know. Um, I remember that her husband was with her, um, and which was a particularly strange in the, the swamp love scene, the one that is rudely interrupted by the doggy with the severed hand in its mouth, which has to be one of the more unusual endings to a love scene in cinema history. Uh, but doing that, where we're kissing and getting into that, I mean, you know, there he is off to the side. I felt you know, a little odd, a little uncomfortable about that. He was fine. It, it wasn't an issue. We, you know, we're actors. But, you know, uh, it, it was a, a, a little strange. <laughs> <laughs> I'd forgotten all about that scene. We're laying there in the leaves and rolling around in the leaves, and Paul and I are having our little thing, and then there comes the dog. <laughs> Plop comes the severed hand. Oh my gosh. One of the things I was worried about was can I scream? I don't know. I don't scream. <laughs> Apparently I can. <laughs> Within this cast, we were full of jewels. These, you know, Ron Sobel and um, and John Dennis and, and so many that you've seen them a million times but never get an opportunity to see them really stretch their legs and get into it. And this film was really a good, good thing for that. Damn you, boy. You stay away from my baby. You stay away from my little girl. Some wonderful actors like Logan Ramsey, who did some of the most hilarious improvisations uh, I could imagine. I mean, he would take what was in essence there in the script, but he would spin off of that a little bit. And uh, the scene where he's making the hamburger and I come and I deliver the groceries and so forth and end up, you know, uh, dining on his neck. Uh, Logan was so funny during that scene, some of these lines, and that um, Philippe was behind the camera jamming a handkerchief into his mouth with tears in his eyes of laughter, trying not to spoil the take. And here I am having to be very intense and, you know, um, very um, uh, famished and, you know, focusing on him with this great, you know, growing uh, uh, hunger. And, um, but inside, I'm also like struggling not to lose control, you know, not to laugh, uh, which is something the British theater refers to as corpsing. <laughs> Um, <laughs> appropriately enough for, for that context. Uh, but uh, I didn't act- I'm proud to say I didn't actually ruin any takes. I came close. I, I was feeling that kind of laughter starting, to, you know, but I, I kept control. Not easy. <laughs> RG was very memorable because here's this guy who's one of the toughest guys in films. And if you've seen uh, Stay Hungry, Oh my God, his fight scene with Jeff Bridges, he's terrifying. And he was this, like, he couldn't find a sweeter guy. His hobby, was, his hobby, believe it or not, was crocheting. 
he would crochet and he he had like a spice garden at home and he would talk i mean it's like only a guy like that, I guess, could get away with crocheting and <laughs> not have anyone tease him about it. Uh, and um, so he was great. Um, everybody was. It was at me, Shaq Taylor. Everybody I can think of uh, was just a, a pleasure and a joy to work with. All the actors, Don Gordon, fantastic. L.Q. Jones, great. Uh, hilarious stories he had to tell about working with um, Sam Peckinpah. Oh, my God. Amazing stories. Uh, that's a whole thing in itself. What Harvey Bernhard did, and Logan Ramsey, the casting director, was also an actor. They cast a terrific group of actors. You know, I mean, those, it was like, in some ways, it was like looking at a, you know, at a Sam Peckinpah stock company. So they were put into a, into a southern gothic horror film. <laughs> what are you going to ask us in? I wasn't able to discuss the script as fully as I might have with Philippe to have helped him follow the logic and what was going on. If you read my original script, it makes a great deal of sense and it's crystal clear what's going on. And you look at the film and the dialogue's still there and all of that, but scenes are collapsed and exposition scenes are taking, taken out. But what happened was is they blended things together to, to make it easier to shoot because their budget was so limited, they lost the logic of it. And not only did they lose the logic of it, they lost a lot of the narrative drive because it was set up, because it was set up as, a, as so, many, so much of what I do, was set up as a thriller and thrillers intercut and they lost a lot of the intercutting. When I look at it, what I see is a film that makes a lot of sense for the first half and then it, it devolves into in, 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 incoherence. And a lot of that is because they lost the... the, 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 the the, the scene that carried the exposition, which was Michael with Tom Laws, which happens in the alley, and Tom Laws explains about the song of the, the cicada and how you can, you can curse your progeny, you know, with, with, with the beast within like the cicada, and that, 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 that Billy Connors will live again through his son to come out, to, to, to emerge, to kill, to kill his son, literally, and to emerge and to take revenge on, on the Kerwin family that... that that turned him into a monster and that killed the woman that he loved. Of course, that's ridiculous. But it's the same kind of, of logic that I used in Child's Play, where there I use voodoo. And if you're into the situation enough and, you care, and you're involved enough with the people, and I think you are with Michael in the script and his parents, that you know, you, you're, you'll, you'll use any, any halfway reasonable sounding justification you know, for, for, you know, for a creature being born inside of you. It was a hell of a script, and I think that, 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 that when they did the blending, I think that Philippe, whom I, I just think is a terrific guy and, a, and, and director, I think he did a terrific job with what he had to work with. I look at it now, and I think that, that all the acting scenes are terrific, but I think that, that, that the, 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 the balloon-headed boy which is to say Michael McCleary and Chloe, you know, it's just the, the effects were so rudimentary at the time that they could not get my vision on film. You know, it just wasn't technically possible. You, 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 you can't. And the incoherence of, of the script and the logic that, that they lost in the script was because of a hack job that Harvey did trying to make it cheaper to produce. You know, so, you know, but that's, that's making film in Hollywood. And I'm sure the same thing is going on right now. But they got enough of it, that, that, that the, the, enough, of the, enough of the script there, that the scenes and the motivations and the themes still come through. And so what happened was, what was a film that, that was not a success when it initially came out has gathered more and more of an audience. And the other thing that happened was it, because, because it went on cable. And became this because you were this is just at the dawn of cable now, so it played on cable in the '80s. So if, if you were a young boy or girl, but especially a young boy because it's about a young boy, it, and you were watching it at home, it was the scariest movie you've ever seen. So I mean, I don't know how many people I've had come up to me and say, you know, that was the most terrifying film I ever saw when I was nine years old. But it, it, it's the rites of passage, or, or or it echoes teenage puberty. That that's one of it. That's one of the, the, the reasons that it has its appeal. I think that Paul Clemens did just a wonderful job. 
and Paul Clemens is a very, very talented actor. So you had these, you had these wonderful performances. I don't know whether I ever saw it on the big screen. I think maybe uh, I only saw it on VHS on my, my probably my 20 inch screen back in those days because I wasn't a big TV watcher either. So no, I'm, 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 I'm excited that it's going to have a new life and maybe I'll get to see it. I, uh, I wonder if I'll recognize myself. I don't feel like I was probably the same guy. I'm sorry, baby. It's exciting. It's like this thing that you've spent a chunk of your life making, that you've committed a, a part of your spirit to. Suddenly you're going to put it out for the world to see. Will they love it? Will they hate it? Will they nurture it? Will they kill it? it it's anxiety levels around the opening of a film are are huge. And you don't know what's going to happen. And for me, since it was one of my first experiences with a film coming out, it was... Uh, very, it's, very, it's exciting. It's really exciting. And then we all got to see this thing that we had worked so hard on, and it's very satisfying. It was my first really big feature assignment, and lo and behold, it got made. And I thank Harvey Bernhardt for that, and Philippe Moore, and everything else. However, at the time, it was not a success. And I, I couldn't get a job for a year after. And of course, I'd spent, I mean, I don't know, oh, six or seven years getting to that point. And it was, it was, it was absolutely crushing. And I, I actually, I thought the movie was quite good, and I especially thought the first half was quite good. And then, of course, the next opportunity I got was a little film called Psycho 2, and that changed my life. You know, it didn't do all that well in the theaters during its initial release, but boy, did it ever do well on home video. Suddenly, it became a big seller there, and over the years, slowly, what I thought was going to wind up being a forgotten movie has turned out to be anything but that. It has a very loyal, devoted cult following, which I'm delighted by, and, you know, because I'm proud of the movie. I think it holds up. Uh, I think it's one of the last examples of... Um, a kind of a raw, gritty kind of approach to horror, where it's all real, no CGI. What you see was what you get, you know, was really there. And uh, it has a nice, you know, wonderful vein of, of dark humor that runs throughout it, and yet it's not too jokey. It's not constantly winking at the audience, as a lot of later horror films did. It took itself just seriously enough. It was filled with all these wonderful H.P. Lovecraft references, kind of in, in jokes and so forth, but it had a genuinely uh, effective atmosphere. Uh, it was, you know, bloody when it needed to be. We didn't pull any punches. Uh, in fact, some stuff had to be cut. It was too extreme, even for then. And the fact that it was not just a slasher thing, you know, it was something, a, a new approach to an old uh, trope, uh, the werewolf genre. I mean, there are certain similarities to uh, Curse of the Werewolf, for example. Yeah, there, there are certain parallels there. It's a, it's a kind of a, um, um, sort of a stepchild in a way of that, I suppose, an offshoot of uh, Curse of the Werewolf. But hey, very different. I mean, a Were Cicada. You know, it's the only Were Cicada movie that I'm aware of. People like a good story. And we were quirky enough and outrageous enough and real enough that it worked. It shed his skin like a cicada. <laughs>